Right, so my name's Claire Parker. I'm a senior product manager um, at the Financial Times. Um, been doing product management now for a good uh, three years, I think. Um, and I've been at the FT for about five and a half years. So um, a little while, and I've done a lot of different things at the FT. Um, but I want to talk about how we develop products at the FT. So I'm going to first of all start talking about um, how we measure as part of our product development. And that's quite a big piece of the talk. I'm then going to talk about how that fits into our wider product approach. And then I'm going to finish off talking about how we've taken a product approach and actually taken that across cultures on a project we're working with um, for our owners, Nikkei, who are based in Japan. And I'm going to let you know how that goes. So to start off, just in case um, you don't know much about VFT, hands up if you've heard about VFT, hands up if you've read VFT, and hands up if you've paid for reading VFT. <laughs> Ah, one. Okay, that's quite good. Um, a lot of the time, all the hands go down with like sad face. Um, but we have around 930,000 paid for um, subscribers. Uh, 730,000 of those are digital. So we're very much in the digital first. Print is still there. It's still important. But everything we tend to do is very much focused on digital. Um, our daily readership is of around 1.9 million. We operate with a very strict payable. Um, and we are basically a subscription-based digital company. So it's obvious that as a product manager, measurement um, is important, metrics are important. But what isn't obvious is sometimes what are the right metrics and how do we pick the right metrics to ensure that they're giving value to us as product managers in our job. So a couple of pitfalls. Um, metrics are always proxies, so you always tend to have a business goal, but you're actually kind of measuring something closer to you. So, for example, um, at Netflix, the metric could be total time spent. Um, I hit 30 this year, so I spend a lot more time falling asleep watching Netflix on a sofa. I imagine other people do. So the real value is actually viewing interesting content. So how does your metric, looking at, okay, how much have you actually watched if you're doing this? actually is that close. For Facebook, their mission is to bring the world closer together. So they might look at news, read, news feed interactions. But if I'm actually looking at loads of content on my news feed and it actually really offends me, <laughs> how is that kind of helping me connect with people I care about? I don't really kind of get the view of polarization. The second pitfall with metrics is that there are many truths. So at the FT, for example, we are trying to work out if people are actually engaged with us. But that is such a buzzword. You could measure engagement by looking at the time spent the readers um, take when they're reading an article. We could look at our Twitter followers. We could look at our Facebook lights. We could look at our app downloads. There are lots and lots of things that we could look at. So what? out of all of the things is the most valuable. That's what you also need to find, because if you pick the wrong one, then you're not really actually learning as you go. And then the third pitfall is that there's just an overwhelming sense of so much data. So we have loads of qualitative data and loads of quantitative data. We have built our own data platform at the Financial Times. So we do our own data track, uh, tracking on our website. Um, and we pump it into our own platform, has a nice API, and we can literally find out anything. Um, we also talk to customers really regularly. So we try and get them in the building, try and understand how, what they like, and also test new ideas with them. So if you have an overwhelming sense of um, you know, too much information, if there's too many data points, what that can actually lead to is a lack of focus. So for us, what we try and do is we kind of call it our North Star, so it's our kind of like guiding metric. Um, we have found a single metric that we use. Um, it's simple to understand for us. It wasn't simple to explain it, but I've given it a shot. Um, and what we do is consistently prove the correlation to our real business goal. And I'm going to explain our North metric now and how it works. So a bit of background around um, news industry. So historically, it was all about digital advertising and print advertising. People then started, uh, stopped, sorry, buying newspapers. So print advertising pretty much fell off a cliff. Um, digital advertising 
again, Facebook, Google, big players kind of came in and they've taken a lot of that chunk of the market. So we at the FT um, kind of thought to ourselves, right, okay, how do we have a sustainable um, business in these kind of environments? So we switch from an advertising model to a subscription model. But it's really hard to do that. So for example, 50% of digital news readers actually come and read content um, via social media. And two thirds of those people do not actually remember the source of the news um, that they read, which is quite scary when we're trying to ask someone to pay for the news because it is really difficult to acquire someone. Uh, we typically use the term, it takes five times the effort to acquire a new reader than it does to keep an existing reader if you look at cost and time taken. So in this kind of environment, we've made the switch to a paid publication, but it's a very, very hard um, thing to do. So this is why we used data, really, um, our data intelligence on customer behavior to help us answer the question, how do we best optimize um, purchase so people actually buy our subscriptions? And then how do we um, best keep people um, happy with their subscriptions so they're more likely to renew? So how do you kind of get more people coming into the funnel and less people dropping out? So for us, um, we looked at subscription and we felt that it was all about habit. So if you've built up an FT routine, so you keep coming to the site, you're using it, you're getting value, you then build out a habit. And then if we can be clever and prompt you to come back in non-annoying ways that are useful, you will continue to come back. So your routine builds. So for us, that is the focus of our business goal. So our business goal is to acquire people and to keep them but we feel the habit is how we are going to do that. So we looked at data and usage, so how many people are using our product, and what we were able to do was positively correlate it to um, revenue via cancellation rate. So the more people used our product, the less likely they were to cancel. And if they were an anonymous user, so someone who hasn't got a subscription, the more likely they were to actually come and kind of like read our stuff, the more likely they were to convert to becoming a subscriber. And that was the case um, for both B2C and B2B. So the Financial Times, you're able to buy a single subscription for yourself, which is our B2C model, but we also have a very strong B2B model. So um, typically how we sell it is that you could have an army of people in your organization who know all the stuff about the Financial Times, uh, sorry, all the stuff that's happening on, in the world um, by expert journalism at the FT. So if you've got account managers going out to clients and if they're going out to those clients saying, well, I know exactly what's happening in your industry, I know exactly what's happening with you, and I know exactly what's happening with your competitors, and I've got that from a quality news source, um, that is something that they pay to have. So what we did was create this single um, engagement score. And this is based on the uh, recency, frequency, and volume. So recency over a time period is how long has it been since you've actually come to us as a, as a site, as a product, and that might be on our app or that might be on our um, responsive site. During that time period, we also look at the frequency of how often you come. And then when you do come to the site, we look at how much you've read. So how many articles did you read per visit? So for us, that is the free components of habit. And what we did was create a very complicated equation um, by our data science team. And what we found was that for us, there's a tipping point. Because not everyone um, is a digital news junkie. So not everyone is going to love um, reading the FT, come every day, read loads of articles every visit, and come very frequently during the day. And we came up with a score um, of 18.2. And I'm not a data scientist, so I can't tell you how we came up with that score. But I promise it's not, um, it's real. And we did come up with that score with accurate data. And what we found is if we can get people over 
as a um, subscriber, they are more likely to renew. And if we have an anonymous reader and we can calculate how often they're coming during one of our trials, for example, you can buy an FT subscription for a pound and try it for a month. If we can look at your, um, how you use a product in your trial and we can safely say you get to a certain level of engagement, we are pretty confident that you will actually then at the end of your trial buy a subscription. And from a product perspective, what this enables us to do is if we've got someone who is like completely in love with VFT, really is getting loads of value, we always ask the question, okay, like should we focus our product development on those people? Or should we focus our people, um, our effort down here on people who are really unengaged? Or shall we try and get more people in the middle and push them over that tipping point? So I'm gonna give a few examples now of how we use that metric. But I just want to reiterate a couple of the key points. So for us at the FT, we are a subscription business. Therefore, we need to be able to acquire people and retain them. We know that if you are engaged in using your, our product, as an anonymous user, you're more likely to acquire. And as a subscriber, you're more likely to retain. We broke that down um, by looking at the recency, frequency, and volume of our readers and kind of calculated them a score, so then we could work out how likely they were with data to cancel or convert. At this point, I'm gonna pause and just open a question out to the room. Does that, is there anything that you'd like me to clarify on that at all? Bear in mind, I'm not a data scientist, but I'll try. <laughs> so, our product vision for FT.com, so this is our main site, is to help readers make better decisions to advance their career um, or business, because we're predominantly a very professional read. And we do that by providing them the most relevant information, um, but we do not obscure the FT view. So we give them the facts, but we also give them the editorial um, views from FT journalists. And what we try and do is build a product that saves them time. So there's so much news out there and there's so much news on our own site. How do we get people to the content they care about most or the content they need? Um, so one of the things we've done is we've built my FT. What it is, is kind of like a personalization tool. So um, we have lots of topics. So for example, um, Brexit, there's a lot we're writing about that at the moment. Um, technology, uh, China, etc. So we've basically got lots and lots of topics um, that we write about. And what we enable people to do is follow a topic that is of interest to them. And this is something that we started with a real MVP back in, I think, 2016. And what we've done is we were able to look at what we did with uh, MyFT and found that if a user is following a topic and receiving alerts on that topic by email when something new is published or able to go to the site, go to MyFT and really find quickly their topic and their articles about that topic, we found that that feature helped increase engagement by 86% compared to people who were not MyFT um, users of a product. So what that enabled us to do was spend a further three years developing this as a product feature. So we had a team of five to seven people um, building this feature for year after year after year and optimizing it. And that's kind of how it's um, grown now. Um, and for us, we were able to make that product decision that that was worth the investment because we saw such a big uplift in engagement. And because we know that engagement ties to cancellation, ties to conversion, ties to revenue, we know that it's worth doing that product investment. So another example um, was speed. So before we, um, when did we launch my, I think 2017, we launched um, our new website, ft.com, um, and it's a lot more responsive. But when we were in our beta phase, um, we were allowing subscribers to opt into our beta to try it out before we launched the site. 
and there were much less uh, content on it and much less uh, features. So it wasn't a really, it was kind of like a bare bones experience, I guess. But we wanted to get customer feedback. We wanted to see what people were doing. So we kind of invited people on, explained it was beta. Um, what we found is that 5% of our loyal customers became immediately more engaged. And we were like, okay, so why is this the case? So we built a hypothesis that the reason they were becoming a lot more engaged is because they were really engaged anyway. So they knew the FT, they were literally coming just to read content. But because our site had less uh, stuff on it, being polite, um, it was a lot quicker. So what we actually did was a, um, a test. So we purposely slowed our site down. So we had uh, the control, which was the fastest site. Um, variant A was one second slower, variant B was two seconds slower, and variant C was three seconds slower. And what we found is over seven days, there wasn't much, um, well, it was about a 5% drop, and there wasn't much between this, but a 7% drop here. And after 28 days of people using our strategically made slow site, we could really see significant drops in engagement. So then what we were able to do in product and tech was effectively, again, because engagement, and I apologies for repeating myself, links to retention, which links to uh, revenue, we were able to basically, to our board members, put a pound sign, don't know why we've got, oh, we've got dollars on there as well, um, for a second. So what this enabled us to do was argue to our stakeholders that we need to invest in the technology of our site. So we um, spent a lot of time um, building product features and making the journalism a lot better on our site, but we also had an entire team of developers focused purely on infrastructure and speed. And as a result, we won, um, you know, we were, when we launched um, the fastest um, compared to some really good websites, so Guardian, New York Times, um, et cetera. And then we also won the best website in 2017 when we launched, and we also won best use of technology. Um, and again, we were able to be given the space in product and tech to focus on speed, because from a data perspective, we were able to prove that it was worthwhile doing so. And then one more um, example. So we had a um, responsive web app um, and we were going into the um, iOS store. And what we did was look at the medium engagement of all of the different readers before um, the app launched. So the people who were on our old app and what we did was when we actually launched was able to measure their engagement so we found the people who were using our old app were way more engaged when they used the ios app we found people who had never used our app before but took out the ios app were more engaged and um, we were able to compare that to non-app users so again that signified to us that going back into the ios store Yep, store um, was useful and was beneficial to us and it made sense for us to continue investing in our um, app <coughs> and lastly we also did this again as a metric for when we looked at okay now we have an iOS app how can we improve push notifications um, so we were able to look at the control group we put a group which were receiving around 15 and a group which was receiving around 30 and we were able to measure their um, medium median RFE, so a median engagement score. So we were able to tailor the amount of um, push notifications that the newsroom or that we would automatically send, um, again, by looking at engagement. So for us at the FT, um, measuring things is really, really important. Um, what we try and do is find a single metric to focus on, one that the whole business can understand and get behind. Um, and we consistently ensure that it actually correlates to our goal. So our goal is, you know, driving, um, keeping our subscribers, and this is business goal, keeping our subscribers um, by renewal and acquiring more subscribers by anonymous traffic. We also try to pick a metric that helps us focus on the most important thing. There are many, many things we can do. Um, and for us, we know that engagement has that dual effect. Um, 
it also gives us one single version of a truth. So for example, our marketing teams, if they target low engaged users, if we're doing something on the product side that's also targeting low engaged users, we know that we're working with the same users. Um, and it enables us to consolidate effort and um, conversation. So we've been able to prioritize our product and development work based on this score, as we, you've seen with the kind of examples. But what we do do is continue to challenge it. So we always ask ourselves, have users actually gained value? Have their numbers gone up as expected? And is our North Star correlation valid and accurate? So this is an um, algorithm um, and a calculation that we continuously do rerun just to ensure that we are, um, it is still making sense for us as a business. And um, so far, that is the case. So that's our kind of approach to uh, measuring, but I wanted to talk about our product approach um, in general. So we always start with business outcomes. So um, we are quite lucky in that um, when we look at, when our board asks uh, product and technology to do things in the year, what they do is ask us to move business outcomes. So that would be engagement, acquisition, uh, revenue, quality, or making things more efficient. So that's kind of the level of where we start. We don't tend to um, start with, can we have feature requests? Can you do this feature? Can you do this feature? We always bring it back to our board level outcomes that we set. Um, and our investment board is what we call them. Um, they kind of uh, oversee the technology and um, product spend. And they all are aware of that those outcomes and they're a cross-functional group. So that's a newsroom, B2C, B2B, um, advertising, probably forgot someone, data, for example. So they're all aware of what we are trying to do as a technology and product team. So what that means is that we have our outcomes and we have a strong product vision um, set in the clear direction for the teams. And when we use measurements, we always do it to learn. So when we, um, you know, with the examples I gave with my FT, we learned that it was a useful feature. So we go back to the investment board and say, we need more funding to develop my FT so we can continue the process. And we can do that at that level, which is quite like a high level funding discussion, or we can do it more in the detail if we're building product features. So like push notifications, for example. And what we also do is try and work lean uh, to de deliver value quickly. So instead of building features that are perfect, what we will always try and do is look at the minimal viable product. So what is the thing that we can test straight away? Because we do a um, learn, build, measure, learn cycle. So if we're going to develop a new product feature because we think it's going to improve engagement, we will look at the data we have at the moment We'll come up with a hypothesis, we'll get some customer data in there, we'll build something and we'll try and make that as small as possible. We'll then release it, we'll measure it, and then we'll kind of learn again and then iterate on it. And um, I'll talk to a bit more about this if you don't follow this as a product um, approach. But for us, it's something that, again, we've been able to kind of persuade the newsroom um, B2C, B2B, that this is a good way of working. So we're not <coughs> striving for perfection we're striving to try and do things quickly um, because um, you know, stakeholders want so many things. Um, so when they kind of say, right, what do you want? They kind of say, we want this and we go, great, that's fantastic. But what outcome are you trying to achieve? What problem are you trying to solve? And then how can we build something very quickly to test that hypothesis that that actually solves that problem, that that actually um, meets that outcome? So, in um, April this year, I joined a uh, project um, which was not following any of the principles um, really that I've just talked about at the FT. Um, the FT was acquired by Nikkei um, in 2015 and they are a huge um, news publisher in Japan. So they're massive in Japan, not expecting anyone to be able to read that. Um, and they have a global business publication that is in English language, and it's called the Nikkei Asian Review. So the idea of Nikkei Asian Review is that um, publications like the Financial Times, the New York Times, uh, the Guardian, they will absolutely write about what's happening in Asia, 
but this uh, newsroom is based in Asia itself. It's got correspondence in uh, Vietnam, in um, Philippines, everywhere, and they are so they can give you a real Asia insight and expertise that even at the FT we struggle to sometimes get just due to the way Asia is. And we formed a partnership, um, so we created what we called synergy projects. And the aim was to share the FT learnings. So we've learned a lot of things in our newsroom to make them digital first. We've learned a lot of things in our marketing teams, both B2C and B2B. And we've been doing product and technology um, a lot longer as well. So we wanted to share what we had learned over our X, you know, 10, 15 years of becoming a digital first news publisher to accelerate um, the digital change across Nick Asia Review. They were still quite print focused and that was kind of in the newsroom. Um, it was true in marketing and it was true on their customer facing products. So um, we built them a new website, which we are continuing to improve. We have improved their newsroom toolings, um, and next year we'll also be looking at their marketing systems too. But a product approach was not being followed at all, so it was like trying to push a big boulder up a hill. Um, so back to pitfalls. Um, the first one was that we had no real clear direction. So we were absolutely delivering things, but they were big, big chunks of work. So it was like, here is a brand new website, and there wasn't a product vision for our website. So we were literally looked at this gray version of our old website and kind of did a copy paste job, but made it blue. Um, we improved certain parts of it, but it was very much, um, there wasn't really like a customer focused vision of what we were trying to achieve. Um, we built a CMS um, this summer, we did a very similar thing. We introduced some definite improvements, but a lot of, a a lot of areas we kind of just did a copy paste because we just had no time. We were rushing to deadlines. And that's because we had abandoned our lean principles. Um, really pretty picture, but not pretty working in this way. We were working in a, a waterfall. It was literally just, um, I joined in April, when we launched the site at the end of the month. So I joined at the start of the month um, and it was like, okay, we need to get a website out. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. And then we then was like, okay, now you need to get a CMS out. And the CMS has to go four weeks after the website launch. And I was like, well, that's not possible. Um, but that was kind of the, the mentality and that really wasn't a fun place to be. Um, and then it was a long distance relationship. I've never been in one and I'm now happy I'm not <laughs> um, because um, we are all the way over on the left and they were all the way over on the right. And that is really, really difficult. Um, at the moment with um, time difference, they are nine hours ahead. So our realistic crossover time is between eight and 10 a.m. So you've got like two hours and all my stakeholders are over there. <laughs> and I'm here with my team. Um, and in the summer, it gets a little bit better. We have a luxury of eight till 11, um, but you know, that's not perfect. And I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges in a minute. So how did we basically go in and say, right, you need to put in a product approach when you don't have things? And data was exactly one of the things we didn't really have. So um, we had some tracking on our website but it wasn't really properly implemented. So um, this was the kind of situation that I was um, thrown into in April. So what we desperately needed was a common purpose. Um, and we didn't have time to do that in April when I joined because it was very much, okay, get the website live. And then we had to build a CMS casually, as you do, very quickly. Um, but in a trip in May, I think, yep. Um, we kind of used it as a reset session. So I was like, okay, what are we actually all here trying to do? Um, and we did a session um, where we had, um, you know, people from Japan, people from UK. We had people from Nikkei, we had people from the FT, but also we had from them, which was quite interesting, um, newsroom, commercial, and product, because even in their organization, I don't know if you have this, but you have silos that appear across the business. And that was exactly this kind of same thing there. So we created this vision statement, um, which was Nick Asian Review provides original quality insight 
that again enables professionals with an interest in Asian business to make informed decisions and gain competitive advantage. So it's even more of a professional read than the FT is probably. But what this did was um, give us a kind of um, just like a common goal of what we were trying to achieve. And this enabled us to kind of then be one team because what we were able to do was then move from a bit more of a client and supplier relationship to like, can you deliver these things to an actual partnership? Because we kind of got everyone to agree on a product vision and say, right, okay, what are we gonna do to make that true for our customers? So I cannot under like, over, I cannot overstate how important a product vision is. And I just thought it was always something that should always, like, it's always there. You kind of look at it, you kind of do things, and you kind of, like, it's there in the background. But when you land into a project that's chaotic, and you ask someone, why are we doing these things, and they're not able to answer, that's not a good place to be. And for us, it was a really valuable exercise to have. Um, the second thing I did was um, introduce a learn, build, measure, learn cycle which was really, really hard to do when the data was in a bit of a bad shape. So what I started doing was um, established business outcomes um, and completely nicked the FT ones for ease, but because they work. So we took uh, acquisition, engagement, revenue, quality and efficiency as our outcomes. So they were the five things that we were trying to do this year. If there was a piece of work that did not meet any of those outcomes, not gonna happen. That's just not going to happen. And then what we did was set up uh, metrics within acquisition, engagement, um, the other three that I now can't remember. Um, and we didn't have an engagement score, but, and we didn't really have enough data. We're still trying to create one, and our data isn't in a great shape, so we're still trying to work out if we have enough of a sample size to actually work out what the engagement score is for this publication. But what we were able to do was know at the FT, recency is important, frequency is important, as is volume. So I had those metrics sitting underneath the engagement outcome. So what we were immediately able to do was um, measure what we were doing. So when we kind of came up with an idea, we would say, right, what business outcome? And then we'd be able to say, like, okay, let's see if improving the onward journey on the article page enables volume to increase. So we were kind of, what we did in an imperfect world was look at, okay, we haven't got an engagement score, but I know these metrics are important, so we'll just measure on them individually whilst we create that score. We persuaded them again that it was make more sense to work in smaller iterations. Um, for Japanese culture, that's really hard because they are a little bit more, um, in business a little bit more detail orientated than us naturally um, the con the idea of not doing something that wasn't completely perfect was a lot more uncomfortable for them than it is for us so that's something that um, really took a lot of persuading we basically got there because we kind of said if you want all of this we're not going to meet your deadline so that's where waterfall actually helped which is a weird saying but that kind of showed them we had to do stuff after launch and then what we did was use data to learn from our work and then help use data to adopt a more continuous approach. So once we had those um, outcomes defined and those metrics, we were then able to measure what we were doing and seeing if it was working. And then the last thing we did, um, in Japanese culture, uh, group consensus is really important. Um, so group harmony is important and, and this is particular particularly important when making decisions. So what the um, previous uh, delivery manager who was a product manager was trying to do was get decisions from about 25 people in the room over a Google Hangout. And those um, people were newsroom, they were B2C, they were B2B, they were senior, they were junior. And that was just a nightmare. Nothing ever, ever got decided, um, which was obviously slowing us down. So what we did, you can't change culture, but you can look at it and change your approach. So we kind of created subgroups. So I created a, a leadership team, um, which consisted of myself, um, the delivery lead on the project, and the tech lead. Because at the FT, we call ourselves the three amigos. So we always work together 
loads. We were really cool. Um, so they never really got that concept. We had like a dancing Mexican Free Amigos and the, it was just like tumbleweed in the room um, when we presented that on the slide deck. And for them, it had their uh, senior, two senior leaders from the newsroom and the two senior leaders from the commercial team because we were kind of forcing them to be one leadership team to actually make some joint decisions. So what we do as a group is prioritization. So we look at our outcomes, we look at our data, look at our problem areas, and then we prioritize the features that will achieve or the problems we want to solve to achieve what we're trying to do. We then created um, a subgroup which we called experts, slightly to flatter the egos. Um, and so once we say, right, this is a problem we're going to solve. So for example, um, our navigation usability is poor. We then create like an expert group and we only work with them on how on that solution. So we kind of get them involved with the process. Um, and we ask them, okay, how can we better improve the nav? Let's look at how people are clicking on it. Let's look at the structure, et cetera. And then what we then do is go back to that group of 25 people and kind of say, they prioritized it. We've worked with them. Here's the designs. Please don't moan kind of thing. That's how we've had to break it down. But yeah, I think actually that's pretty much the end of the talk. From a Taking a project approach across cultures, um, my belief is that a product development approach can completely work across cultures. That's fine. It's a really good approach and it's something you should really do. What you should do, however, is tailor how you work together. So for example, I've never had my prioritization list in a spreadsheet. It kills me every day. I love Trello, <laughs> um, but it completely works for my stakeholders. So tailor that approach. Um, I would never want to go through so many groups to review a design and get sign off, but I need to do that due to the stakeholders, for example. Um, and what we do on our program is we have for our product development, learn, build, measure, learn. We do exactly the same for ways of working. So we've done, so, we've done loads of things where that has completely fallen flat and missed the mark and our stakeholders are like, we hated that. So we take that feedback and then we kind of continue to iterate.